Hey, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of John. Uh, we'll pick up where we left off last time at verse uh, chapter 3, verse 29. Uh, but before we get started, let me ask uh, Brother Eric and Brother Stephen to say hi to everybody. Hello everybody. It's me again. The Holomo. Okay. Uh, and just type that in and uh, subscribe and uh, back to you, Brother Luke and Brother uh, Stephen. Hey there, everybody. Brother Stephen here, you know, known as you on YouTube here as Stephen Rivers TV. Uh, you know, enjoying another time of Bible study and fellowship. Praise Jesus. Okay, uh, now uh, we do these broadcasts uh, nightly. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground already in the book of John, but I, I hope you will go back and watch uh, the study from the beginning because uh, particularly in this book, uh, chapter 1 is, the first half of chapter 1 is just amazing. And, and the, the whole chapter of Chapter 3 is one of the most important uh, books of the whole Bible, I think. So I hope you will watch it from the beginning. Uh, we're going to pick it up now with John chapter 3, verse 29 in the KJV first. It says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. Verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. All right, and of course that's, that's not in, in red letters, and uh, that is, th those are the words of John the Baptist. All right, and what are your comments on that? So right there, uh, John the Baptist is uh, admitting to being the friend of the bridegroom. Now, uh, I'm wondering if John the Baptist will be coming back to announce the coming of uh, Jesus Christ, uh, where it's uh, spoken of in the parable, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. I don't know uh, There's speculation on that. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I guess it's my turn. Well, um, well, going back to, I guess, I guess I'll piece in a little bit of like what we were doing of like last week. This is about when the people were coming in, you know, coming to John and like we're giving the alertness of like, you know, Jesus performing his works and like the baptisms that were going on. But like when he says, you know, that he that, excuse me, but um, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice greatly because of the the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. That's because now that he sees that, you know, Jesus is actually doing his works, and that Jesus is actually, you know, increasing and spreading the kingdom of God. You know, this is where his joy is coming from. Is you know Jesus performing his work, and of course the next verse, he must increase, but I must decrease. You know, it's. Simple, you know, this is all about Jesus. This is not about me, John the Baptist. You know, this is all about him. And, you know, it's he needs to be pushing forward, but you know, and I need to be, like, detracting because this is not about me. I am not the Savior, you know, and I am not the light. Yeah, the uh, coming up, we're going to hear Jesus proclaim that uh, no man ever born was was greater than John the Baptist and and so we're talking I think it was yesterday in our study of uh, Job uh, we're, we're talking about or maybe it's the day before it was Job uh, <clears throat> talking about how great Job was and some of the great characters in the scriptures but Jesus says that uh, nobody was greater than John the Baptist of course he didn't live very long he was a young man when he was killed and uh, 
I guess though in his, the short ministry he had, um, what he did was one of the most important things ever done in history, and that is introducing and identifying the, the promised one. So he did that, but uh, he understood, I uh, remember in chapter 1, uh, they kept on pushing him, asking him, who, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you that prophet? And he, he said, no, he's, he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he's preparing the way for the Messiah. He's the one who will introduce him. And he did that. He's Even at this point, he's already done his job. He pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God, and uh, his followers started leaving him and then following Jesus. And so he, he was decreasing, and Jesus' uh, just number of disciples and popularity was increasing. So pretty much everything he was uh, called to do, he's already accomplished. And, but he's also expressing his joy over the fact that the Messiah is here, he knows who it is, and, and that he is increasing. Um, I'm going to read it in the Amplified and see if there's anything interesting in there that we can discern. Uh, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands by and listens to him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this pleasure and joy of mine is now complete. He must increase in prominence, but I must decrease. All right, I, before we go on, anything else come to mind about that? those verses? Those were great responses from you and Stephen, Brother Luke. Okay, back to you. All right, well, going into this, I mean, I really like what was going on. You know, by this point, John had fulfilled his job, you know, and Jesus was increasing. And, you know, as it says here, you know, John is taking, you know, great joy in this, as, you know, he should be, as, you know, being the, you know, I mean, as I'll put it in, the best man, you know, of the husband. You know, you know, it's his job to, you know, pretty much oversee and introduce him, you know, prepare the way for him, and, you know, he did just that. And now, you know, everybody, you know, of course, all these people, like the reason we got to this part was because a lot of John, some of his followers that were just big on him were getting worried because so many people were leaving him. But, the, but then again, John's saying, you know, this is how it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to decrease, and it's all about him. You know, it's not about me here. Well, the the term the best man, I mean, I can see how that applies uh, in terms of the relationship between the best man and, and, the, and the, the groom in a wedding, but it also applies to what we were saying earlier about how much uh, Jesus praised John and said no one was ever better, so in that case he could be the best man too. No man was ever better than John the Baptist. Let me move on. Uh, to verse. Great, great analogies, guys. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, back to you. Okay, I'm going to go on now in the KJV, uh, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. <clears throat> well, verse 31, uh, I, I assume this is still John the Baptist speaking here. See, we have, uh, sometimes it, it's hard to identify what exactly the, this, this verse is. Is is it the words of Jesus? Well, <clears throat> in some Bibles, all the printing is in black letters against a white background. But other Bibles, they, they print the red letters are supposed to be, these are the words of, that directly came out of Jesus' mouth. <clears throat> and then you have other, other words uh, in the book of John that are the words that John wrote down 
just writing down his account. It's, uh, and, and then you've got also what we just talked about. These are the words of John the Baptist that we just read. In this case, I don't know if there's any way of knowing. Uh, I'll be interested to see in the Amplified if, if they inter interpret in a way that it's John the Baptist speaking or not. But well, let me get your response to that. Well, I thought maybe I would go back over and highlight all of John's words in uh, blue. Since he was the best man, I think blue would be a good color for him. Okay, back to you. All right, well, looking at the words of this here, you know, he that cometh, you know, this is about talking about Jesus here. He that cometh from above, Jesus is above all. And, of course, the saying the P of this earth, which he could be talking about himself here, you know, is, you know, of earth. You know, he's just, you know, a person. You know, he's nothing special. He's not the one. But, again, also, that's the same thing, you know, with every person. You know, none of us are Jesus, and there's no other way but him. And it says, he that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, you know, that he testifieth, and no man receives his testimony. I mean, Right now, up to this point, Jesus had been, you know, spreading his word, spreading his gospel, you know, and telling people, you know, all the parables, the heavenly things. But a lot of – most people were, you know, not believing and, you know, were rejecting it. So this is kind of just like, for me, like an account of pretty much just looking at, you know, like the people's, like, response to Jesus, to his testimony, even though, you know, he was Lord God Almighty and he came from above. And – yeah, I kind of like that. We're not exactly sure, I guess, who's talking, but I would definitely have to assume this is John the Baptist in this situation. Yeah, I I don't think that we can... Uh, Brother Eric, if you want to take the blue ink and, and, and designate John's words, then you're far better than me because I, I, I can't necessarily uh, speak with authority uh, that... that certain words are his, like this, these verses here, it appears to me that it's John speaking still, but I don't know if that was certainty. Well, if you, if you read on, if you keep reading, you will see that it is John speaking in the next verse. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be going on, but first I want to talk about that verse a little bit more. It says, he that cometh from above is above all. So I'll assume that for a moment this is John speaking, and he's referring to Jesus. So he's saying, Jesus came from above, and he's uh, from heaven. He's above all. And he was just finished saying that uh, that he's just the bride. He's just a friend of the bridegroom, and that uh, and and the, he must increase and I must decrease. And then he refers back to Jesus and continuing to talk about Jesus. He that cometh from above, being Jesus, came down from heaven. He that is of the earth is earthly, referring to himself again, I think. So he's, he's, he's drawing this distinction that, like he did before he, when he was asked who he was. Uh, he, he says, no, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm going to introduce him. And I, the one I'm going to introduce, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And I think this is what he's, the point he's making again here is that uh, Jesus came from, from above. I mean, he's he's God. He came down from heaven. I'm just from the earth. I'm just, uh, you know, that's why I must I must decrease because it's not about me. This whole thing it's about Jesus, not me. That's why I've got to decrease. He's going to increase. And then, verse 32, though, uh, I'm not sure what to say about that. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth and no man receiveth his testimony. Uh, I'll, I'll read a little further. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. <clears throat> I'm going to have to look at that in the Amplified to try to understand it better, but what's your re reaction to those verses? I think John's still talking about himself when he's not supposed to be. <laughs> okay, but it looks like to me that John's go still talking. 
he that received his testimony, I think he's talking about himself there. John was the one that received his testimony, wasn't it? Uh, am I mistaken there? Well, John is the one that gave testimony that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Son of God. So John gave that testimony. He was the one that identified him. But also he received a testimony in a sense when the uh, his um, vision or his he heard a voice that said, You're, when you see someone where this spirit descends above them uh, like a dove, you'll know that's the one. And then when he baptized Jesus, that's what happened. So that experience of seeing the Holy Spirit on Jesus, uh, that could be the testimony that John received that confirmed that uh, he was right in identifying him. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what it's referring to, but that's that's how I see the testimony <clears throat> that he gave about Jesus and the Holy Spirit gave to John about Jesus. Okay, but it's not real clear there, I guess. Uh, the author uh, didn't make it real clear there in verse uh, 32. Uh, maybe, what do you think, Stephen? Well, um, okay, well, just looking at, you know, verses, I guess I'll just look back, you know, like at verse 32 through 34, like for this one. Um, well, I mean, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that receiveth his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Well, I mean, is what I was just saying about 32. It's, um, you know, Jesus was testifying, you know, of the kingdom of God, you know, and of, like he had to do it in parables because, as he said, you know, if you can't understand the earthly things I say, then how are you going to understand, like, the heavenly things that I say? And then um, after that, it says, He that receiveth his testimony, well, received his testimony, has set to his seal that God is true. So those who have like received and like accepted Jesus, you know, believed who He has, like they're the ones that know that. Um, let's say looking that you know God is true. It's like that they've really come to know you know God like the real way, like having faith alone in Christ alone, you know, as it's supposed to be. Although of course they didn't exactly have the. Um, they're not like us who had the advantage, I guess, of like looking, being able to see into the past and like have all this stuff, but. They had known it was true. And then, for he whom God has sent speaketh by the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. You know, he's speaking literally just of the kingdom of God. You know, and just everything that he got was from God, you know, who sent him. You know, and Jesus said himself, you know, all this was given from his Father who sent him. That's pretty much all I have, you know, for this one as of right now. Uh, well, that was interesting, but I don't I don't know how. Let me see. You got from those verses <clears throat> the uh, kingdom of God. Um, did I miss something there? Um, I think that uh, this testimony is is about the person of Jesus. Uh, but let me read this in the Amplified and see if it helps us at all. It says. Uh, Verse 31, I'll start with, He who comes from heaven is above all others. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks about things of the earth. His viewpoint and experience are earthly. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has actually seen and heard of that, he testifies. And yet, no one accepts his testimony is true. Uh, I think that verse 32 from this, the way these verses are fitting together here, it's talk, he's still talking about he who came from heaven. It says, he who comes from heaven is above all what he has actually seen and heard of that he testifies, and yet no one accepts his testimony is true. I think it's uh, the testimony that Jesus is uh, giving. Whoever receives his testimony has set his seal of approval to this, God is true, and he knows that God cannot lie. 
For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, proclaiming the Father's own message. Let me see, I'm on verse 34. Uh, for God gives the gift of the Spirit without measure, generously, boundlessly. Okay, so I'll stop there on, and we'll go to the, the KJV for 35 and 36. But uh, you com when you compare the, uh, the Amplified on those verses, does it help at all? Well, it did help me quite a bit, Brother Luke, because I went back over and read the King James while you were reading uh, the Amplified, and as Bill would like to say, the penny finally dropped on me, and I fully understand the whole passage. Okay, back to you guys. Well, I mean, the way that, I guess it's like the, the way you said it in the Amplified was, I guess, a little bit different for how I interpreted it while reading, you know, the... KJV. I don't exactly remember what you had said in the Amplified, but I guess it's like when I looked at the like the KJV, when I was seeing that um, for he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. I guess that's where you know I pulled out you know the kingdom of God because that's all you know what Jesus would talk about because he would compare the kingdom of God to many things when talking to people, and a lot of people and of course he's speaking the words of God, but yeah, and a lot of people just were not really understanding, like, you know, the parables. So I guess that's what I was really referring to when I was talking about the kingdom of God earlier. Yeah, okay. I, I, I see how you uh, made that, that connection. Uh, but I think in this particular part, he's talking about what Jesus was saying about himself, who he is, what he came to do, and, of course, uh, how you get into the kingdom of God. He talked about that already in his testimony to uh, Nicodemus. Okay, I'll read these. Yeah, I have misread that one probably a little bit. Let me uh, look at the last two verses here in KJV now. It says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This is one of the great verses that I use a lot, an awful lot in evangelism, uh, showing the, that there's two groups of people. Um, those that believe on the Son have life. Those that do not believe on the Son do not have life. Uh, they have a death sentence, uh, the second death. They die the first death, and then they die the second death in the lake of fire. It says, the wrath of God abideth on him. <laughs> Um, there's numerous verses that, uh, this is one of those that really shows that contrast. Which group do you want to be in? Uh, but it's all based upon believing on the Son. All right. Amen to that. Well, looking, you know, well, obviously these, these two pretty much speak for themselves. You know, Jesus had already said that, you know, the Father had given him the power, you know, you know, even over death. But, of course, you know, this is just, it's a critical part of the gospel, like right here. He that believeth on the Son, he, you know, hath everlasting life. You know, as Jesus said, you know, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man will come to the Father, you know, but by me. And he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He that believeth in me, you know, is not condemned, but he that does not believe, you know, is already condemned. You know, and that's what, you know, this is just saying right here. He that believeth not, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus to be saved and you don't count on him only, there's no chance for you. I mean, that's just the truth. That it, that's just the truth, and that's just how it is. It's Jesus or nothing. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's not just that... Um, We have, uh, we're condemned or we're not condemned. Earlier verse said, it said, I think in John 3, 15, it says, if you believe on, on, on him, you're not condemned. If you don't believe on him, you're condemned already because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So here you have this the, uh, contrast again. Uh, those who believe are not condemned. Those who do not believe are condemned already. 
Um, so by by if if every person is naturally condemned, that's our normal natural state. Uh, the only thing that uh, that can cure that, that can remedy it, or pardon the condemnation, would be believing on on the Son. Uh, so these two verses, I, I really like them because within a, within a single verse, you you see these two groups of people. You get to be either one of the condemned or one of those pardoned. You get to be one of those that has life or one that doesn't have life, life but rather has the wrath of God on them. Uh, but then there's that group of people, I think I've talked about this before, I'll probably have to mention it many times as we go through here, there's a group of people that, that believe that um, uh, everybody will actually go to heaven. And because they think that, uh, well, even if they end up condemned and they don't have life now, and but they're, and they're also condemned, as soon as they get into hell, you know, they'll realize it and they'll repent. And how long do they have to be in the fire before they start, you know, saying, Lord, Lord, uh, and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So if you're in fire, I mean, you're going to say whatever you, whatever you uh, have to say to get out of that fire. So the universalists believe that uh, even if a person goes to hell, uh, someone just sent me an email yesterday, a friend of mine, and it was it had some in, uh, teaching that attached to it that he wanted me to look at, <clears throat> and it, it's from somebody that teaches that the cross and hell are simply, the, uh, the real true meaning of the cross and hell is a cleansing or, or healing method. It's the method by which man gets cleansed and healed, which is not true at all. Uh, so there are people that think that, well, everybody, even if people go to hell, they end, they end up getting saved anyway. Uh, uh, but uh, that, that's not the case. I mean, if we look at John 3.16, it says that one group perishes and the other group has life. And what does perish mean? Again, my position on eternal torment is that uh, I have a playlist titled um, Eternal Torment Versus Eternal Death. I hope everybody will watch that playlist. It's, it's a very thorough arguing against the, the doctrine of eternal torment and arguing for what's called conditional immortality and annihilationism. But I think that... Uh, if people could go to hell and then get saved after that, we couldn't say that there's a, a particular group that actually perishes. Because when you go to hell, if you can get out of hell, you don't really perish, do you? No. Yeah, definitely that you wouldn't be perishing if there was a way out. You know, it's either you perish or you have everlasting life. And, I mean, as it said, there's no in-between. All right, I'm going to read these last two verses here in the uh, Amplified now, verse 35 and 36. The Father loves the Son and has given and entrusted all things into his hand, he who believes and trusts in the Son and accepts Him as Savior has eternal life, that is, already possesses it. But he who does not believe the Son and chooses to reject Him, uh, disobeying Him and denying Him as Savior, will not see eternal life, but instead the wrath of God hangs over Him continually. I think they did an excellent job uh, expounding on that. I particularly like this part right here where it says it says that uh, uh, he who believes and trusts in the Son and accepts him as Savior has eternal life that is already possesses it. And that's an important thing that people miss sometimes is that it says we have you have eternal life that means you possess it right now and if you possess eternal life the, it, 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 obviously, if it's eternal life, 
then it could not be ever forfeited, lost, or, or given back, or anything else, or, or it would have never been, could never be legitimately called eternal life. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it proves a lot of things that uh, that verse, if you understand that half life is present tense. Absolutely. Uh, that's the whole point of the new birth. Right? We're born immediately into the kingdom of God once we believe. With by the imperishable, incorruptible word of God. And uh, it's you must be note there, imperishable and incorruptible uh, kind of says uh, it can't be taken away by any means. Okay, back to you. Yeah, well, I mean, salvation from Jesus is a gift. And, you know, Jesus promised salvation to everyone who believed. And, of course, the tense is, you know, half everlasting life, as in you have it. But the thing is, you know, when Jesus makes a promise to you, like that you have everlasting life if you believe on him, you know, he's not like, you know, a human who can break a promise. He's not going to break that promise. Like, he's going to stay true to his word. And, like, once someone believes, you know, as Jesus said, you know, you have passed on, you know, from death to life. You know, you have everlasting life. You're born to the kingdom of God. You have the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he is your Savior, and, you know, and he's your Lord. And, like, and when Jesus said, you know, it's not by, you know, any works or any other thing, but just by believing on him. And by believing on him, you have it. You know, it's yours, and it's never going to be taken from you. Okay, I think that'll finish for Chapter 3. We'll move on to Chapter 4 now. And uh, reading first in the KJV, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, uh, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. All right, so let me get your reaction to that. Well, um, I know usually Eric goes first, but this reminds me of something. Last week you were talking about there was a verse that when it said that Jesus did not actually perform the baptisms well, we just went right over it. You know, 14, I mean, 4 2, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. But anyway, looking at this, um, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had baptized more disciples of John. You know, he left Judea and departed into Galilee. Well, I mean, it's probably because his time has not come to die yet, but but still, it's just showing that he's still baptizing and, you know, expanding his kingdom, you know, here, you know, on earth at this point. Yeah, I was wondering if you're going to notice that that verse confirmed what I was uh, claiming, that we were discussing two or three verses that uh, if we didn't know better, we would think that Jesus was performing baptisms. Uh, and yet I recall that there's a verse that says, no, Jesus didn't, just as disciples did. And I figured we'd be coming to it, but so there it is. But I don't know if it's like a, a distinction without a difference, uh, because his disciples would not be baptizing people without Jesus authorizing it and, and you know, uh, overseeing it probably, uh, even though he didn't personally do it. But the point, the point is that he did not personally baptize, but his disciples were baptizing, so Jesus must have given the okay, I think. What do you think? Oh, absolutely he gave the okay. And there's something there that uh, needs to be considered, which uh, begs a question. What is the purpose of uh, them baptizing before the Holy Ghost was given? Okay. Well, I mean, I would say Jesus definitely, you know, authorized it because, 
you know, one of the last things he said before, you know, rising up into heaven after, you know, being risen from the dead was, you know, go therefore, you know, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, he's def I feel like he definitely was authorizing this. Uh, yeah, uh, but I don't understand your question, Eric, so let me say it again. Uh, uh, doesn't it seem odd to you that uh, we're doing baptisms before the cross? No, it doesn't. It doesn't really seem odd to me. Uh, uh, John was doing baptisms. What was the purpose of John's baptism, and what was the purpose of Jesus' baptism? Uh, I mean, performing his disciples performing baptism. Uh, as a matter of fact, what was the purpose of Mosaic laws and and animal sacrifices of, in in uh, Judaism? Uh, they were never meant to give people salvation. It was just something that's temporary. It's like, uh, what's the word? Um, um, Aaron Budgen drew a distinction between two words, propitiation and um, atonement. Atonement means that it was covered up. It's like when we were talking about Job, I think we two nights ago, or I don't remember. I get confused. I think it was Job was two nights ago, not last night. That was Proverbs. But I've mentioned many times referring to Job's statement that his sins were put in a bag and, and uh, it was sewed or tied shut. And um, uh, that and all the other things that we've been discussing, like baptism, like animal sacrifices, these are uh, atonements in terms of it's just temporary covering. You're here, the sins, nobody's sins were ever propitiated and paid for. Anybody who's ever lived, nobody's sins were paid for until Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Until then, they just had like a temporary covering over it. And that's atonement. Propitiation means they're wiped away, they're removed, they're disappeared, they're gone forever. And it's uh, so <clears throat> I think that the baptism before the cross, that was that was just another example of something symbolic to show that this the sins are going to be covered, but they're not paid for until the death on the cross. And uh, what about you, Stephen? What would you uh, concur to that? Mm, um, I guess for right now. I just don't have really too much to say right the right this second. Okay, brother Luke. So what's the point of being baptized after we're saved? Well, I've I've talked at length about this. I, I maybe in John I've talked about it, uh, but uh, the the only baptism that really has uh, um, um, should I say, uh, really accomplishes anything for salvation is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that happens to everybody at the instant they put their faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into them. And that's baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I, I think that I thought by now John would have already made the distinction of John or Jesus between uh, two types of baptism. We had, I think, one of them spoke about baptism uh, with uh, born of water. No, Jesus spoke of being born of water and of the Spirit. But uh, I'm talking about baptism. Uh, I think that there's going to be a, a, an explanation of this coming up. But the purpose of water baptism for a believer is it's I believe it's not required for salvation otherwise we would say that it's faith plus water baptism faith plus some kind of religious work that you have to do uh, 
uh, it, and, and then the, there's a group of people who believe you must be water baptized. The, the uh, theological term for it is called baptismal regeneration. They think you believe in Jesus and you're not saved until you get wet. When you get wet, the water causes you to be born again, regenerated. Uh, but uh, that's not biblical. And then there's another group of people I've mentioned numerous times, the Paul onlyists. They're also called hyper or ultra dispensationalists. And, 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 and they believe that you must never get wet. You ne must never get water baptized because it's an indication that your faith is not entirely on Jesus. Your faith is divided between I got to believe in Jesus and get water baptized. So they, they basically forbid it. Uh, but the, the correct answer, I believe, is that we're, we don't have to get water baptized for salvation, but it's also not forbidden. It's encouraged and, and said, get water baptized. Uh, over and over again, we give examples of people who do get water baptized after they get saved. But it, I think the water baptism is the first and, and uh, opportunity a person gets to make some kind of public statement about, uh, I'm... Uh, I believe in Jesus. I put, I just put my faith in Jesus, and I, I don't mind everybody knowing about it. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. I, I'm, I'm willing to go public. And the water baptism, being submerged in water, that's like being believing in Jesus or believing into Jesus, being immersed in, not immersion in water, but immersed into Jesus. It's also symbolic of the the death and burial and then coming out of the water is the resurrection uh, of, of Jesus and the one that we look forward to. You know, we, we die spiritually, we're born again spiritually, and we will be resurrected physically. So there's a lot of value and reason for us to get water baptized, but it's not, it's not essential for salvation. Now, I, I, I've explained this quite a few times in videos. I, Go ahead. Right. And uh, we know, according to scriptures, there is one baptism. And that's uh, when we get born again. And uh, as far as being baptized after we're saved, uh, there is a scripture that mentions that that's uh, having a clear conscience before God. Uh, are you familiar with that verse? I'm sorry, I was rereading the verses we just covered. I lost track of what you're saying there. Go ahead, say it again, please. Uh, there is a verse uh, that states, uh, Baptism doth now save us. Uh, even baptism doth now save us, but not by the putting off of the uh, something or another, but by answering the having a clear conscience before okay I'm gonna look that verse up real quick uh, what it uh, have you ever heard you know what verse I'm talking about no I don't know uh, okay you can find that we'll go back to that later but Stephen anything about this before we, we move on uh, yeah well I mean when it comes to like you know water baptism I mean I believe you know everyone who's been saved should I think everyone should do it because it's it's a big time testimony about you know being saved you know being you know you know having the old man dying and you know rising again but because of Jesus it's it, you know it's a testimony it's very important but of course you know the baptism of the Holy Spirit definitely takes place you know when you are saved but of course you know you'll see it all throughout you know the Bible like you'll see like actually mostly an action from what I've seen, but you'll see a, you know, a bunch of instances where you know, the Holy Spirit was received before people were even water baptized. So, I mean, you, know, you definitely don't have to you know, be water baptized to be saved, although it's definitely, you know, it's definitely a testimony that you, everyone should do, but you don't have to do it to be saved because that would be adding something else to salvation. That's like having faith in the water and Jesus when... Clearly, you know, the only faith that we're supposed to have is in Jesus, you know, and in Jesus alone. Yes, very good. Okay, I found that verse, 1 Peter 3, 1. 
I'll go ahead and read it. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, how would, are you, you, have you ever heard of that verse? Uh, could you comment on that? Uh, not without going into the whole context of it. Yeah, I don't want to go off get sidetracked too far. But uh, I can look at it and get back to you on it. I'm trying to find a, something by Geisler. Not the Geisler you're thinking of. Uh, uh, on Acts 2.38. Um, it talks about uh, baptism should be translated immersed. Uh, rather than the word baptized. We think of baptism as being immersed into water, but the when we, if we think of the word being immersed, uh, then we can see that it's, it's referring to um, uh, immersed into Jesus by believing into him, as I was trying to explain. But I don't see it. It's Acts 2.38, but I can't find the well, name channel. Acts 2.38 is uh, talking about the new birth and not the actual uh, ritual of baptism that we observe. What do you think, uh, Stephen? Uh, about Acts 2.38? Or just whatever, anything. What are you thinking right now? <laughs> well, I mean, let's go. I'm going to flip over to Acts 2.38 now, but hold on. I've got it right in front of me almost right. Hold on, let me look at it. Okay, here we go. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, you know, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, this is what we were just talking about. Um... You know, when it comes to, you know, the instant you believe you receive. But I like that analogy that uh, Luke said there. When it was um, being immersed, you know, in Jesus. Because, I mean, that's, you know, what happens when you believe, you know, your old self dies. You become a new creature. You know, the old man is, you know, is gone. And, you know, now you're a new man. But that's only because of, you know, Jesus. So it's like you believe, you know, in him. You know, and now, like, you have Jesus. You've been, you know, immersed in him. And you, you be, you've been forgiven, and, you know, right then you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, right in that moment. Well, I'm, uh, we got more sidetracked than I wanted to on the, the baptism. But uh, I wish I could find that video. I probably have it saved somewhere uh, under my favorites. Dang, what's his name? Dave Geisler. Yeah, you know, let me look at, let me see if I can find it real quick. Okay, uh, keep looking for it. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, I agree with Stephen. I like that uh, viewpoint very much. I believe it, it'll uh, fit in Scripture without breaking anything. Uh, if you'd like to comment on that, Brother Luke, uh, go ahead. But. Uh, I think for now I will go with that until I've heard from the rest of my lawyers on that topic. Okay. Hmm. Well, I found his, his one of his channels, Dave Geisler. Uh, I'd have to go through here more carefully to find his video on... Uh, okay, go ahead and keep looking. I can still talk. Now, uh, actually, Acts 2.38 is one of the seven thunders that was rejected by my lawyers. And uh, I don't blame them because we can't have people going around thinking we have to be baptized to be saved because that's simply not what Scripture teaches. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Um, well, like there's one group of... I know I've... I probably have some of this, but there's one group of people, you know, that I know of here on YouTube that really abuses that verse you know, talking about repenting and being baptized, and it's like they really twist the meaning of it, and they have this kind of as their, pretty much like this their channel statement versus here, saying that like, but of course the way they have it, you know, I'm going to like just read it, you know, hold on, ugh, lost it. Let me, hold on, let me get there again. But, but it was saying repent, 
you know, and be baptized. Like the way they say it is, you have to, you know, repent, you know, beg for, you know, Jesus for His forgiveness. You know, stop sinning. You know, repent. Then you have to be baptized in water. And then after all, you take all these steps. Then He'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's just the way they twist. They just twist it up so bad to like saying it's like a you know things that you have to do. Instead of actually, you know, just you know, coming to Jesus, you know, in faith, as this really says it is. All right. Um, I can't find that right now. I'll have to look for it, try to remember to find it, and next time I'll I'll send it to you. It was an excellent video explaining to Acts two thirty eight in the translation of the word. Um, it's uh, as bapt baptize. Uh, in the KJV uh, is incorrect. It should be immersed because immersion in baptism is is the same thing in terms of being immersed. But rather than be immersed into water, we're immersed into Jesus through faith. That's the point he makes, but he does a you know an hour explaining it. Uh, all right, I'm going to go to. Uh, we'll finish up here at. Uh, I'll, the last few verses we covered, I'll read them again and get final remarks, and then we'll, we'll uh, end here. When therefore the Lord knew, oh, let me read it in the Amplified. It says, so when the Lord learned that the Pharisees had been told that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and returned again to Galilee. So we'll pick up with verse 4. John 4.4, 4. next time. Okay, uh, so let me get you guys, give you a minute for each of you to uh, make any um, uh, summary remarks about the study today. Well, I'm sorry I bogged this down on that baptism thing because I was looking ahead at verse 4 where Jesus must needs go into Samaria, and I had a wonderful epiphany that I, I just can't talk about it now till uh, tomorrow's episode. <laughs> okay, back to you. Yeah, I know we definitely got, you know, really sidetracked, you know, in the last 15 or so minutes. But, um, but yeah, looking back at this, you know, looking at, you know, the bride, the bridegroom, you know, he must increase, but I must decrease. You know, this is all about, you know, Jesus. He is the one who came from, you know, heaven. He was the one whom God sent, and, you know, he spoke, you know, God's word. You know, a lot of people, you know, reject him, you know, but those who, you know, have accepted, you know, him, you know, have set to his seal that God is true. Like, they've actually come to, like, the truth, you know, in Jesus, and, you know, about God, rather than, you know, the version that, you know, the Pharisees had given, you know, at this time. And, you know, he, that, and, of course, the most important verse, I would say, that we've studied, you know, tonight, is definitely, you know, John 3.36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, you know, but the wrath of God abideth, you know, on him, because that is, you know, that's the only way to be saved. Yep, I know, I know, looking at the time right now, it's probably about that time that we, you know, share the gospel and give our invitation as we're, you know, as we're getting close to the end. So I guess... I know, like, Brother Luke is going to do this, but I guess I can get this started a little bit beforehand. Um, but looking at, you know, that verse 3, that's, it's very important. You know, only by coming to Jesus can one be saved. You know, it's not through, you know, any other means, not through, you know, any religion, you know, not through any works, you know, from any self-effort or just from literally, you know, anything else, not the sun, not a tree. Okay, I know I'm going a little bit abstract here, but it's just there's nothing else besides Jesus. You know, as Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man will come to the Father, you know, but by me. You know, the gospel is, you know, it's incredible. You know, it's not just, you know, it's the good news. And it's not, it's not just some story because it's true and because it just shows how amazing God is. The fact that he was willing to come here, you know, in the flesh to this planet, willing to take on flesh, you know, take on, you know, potentially, you know, our corruption, but yet he did not sin. He was perfect. You know, he lived the perfect life. He fulfilled the law. He pleased God. 
and you know he did everything that his father sent him to do. Then, you know, on top of all that, you know, he promised, you know, everlasting life, to, you know, to everyone who believes on him. He performed miracles, but you know, he ultimately proved who he was when he rose from the dead. But before that, you know, he was crucified, and you know, he was buried for three days, and then he rose again, you know, proving who he was. But when he died on the cross. You know, he died for our sins, and he pinned all of our sins to the cross along with him so that we, you know, will all be washed away. You know, as we were talking about, you know, those bagged-up sins of Job, those were all released onto Jesus, and, you know, as is every sin that we do. And, you know, eternal life is a gift from Jesus. It's not a work or anything. You know, Jesus bought it with his blood and by dying for us, and there's no other way. There's literally nothing else. He gave, you know, the only sacrifice— you know, and afterwards he sat down at the right hand of God. But only by believing on him and accepting the gift, you know, can one be saved. And of course, to accept it is to believe. You know, you come to him, you put all your trust in him alone, you know, and not yourself. You know, just ask him to save you, and you know, he'll be very faithful. And you know, once you believe on him and you're saved, you're saved forever. You have his Holy Spirit. You'll never ever have to worry about salvation again because you know it's guaranteed to you, and you know Jesus' words are not going to pass away. You know, even as it says, "As heaven and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away," and He's not going to take back His promise. So that's it. Faith alone in Christ alone. That's the only way to be saved. Brother Eric. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, I love how you went on a tangent uh, talking about those things that are trapping us and keeping us from coming to Christ. And if the truth be known, all those things that we are clinging to that are keeping us from coming to Christ are shouting at the top of their lungs, Don't look at me. Look to Jesus. Because this whole universe was fashioned after the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I mean, just one last comment. You know, it's like the nat the man's natural way is, you know, we just want to fix things ourselves, and we want to do it ourselves, but, you know, that's not the way. You know, we can't factor anything into our salvation besides, well, Jesus told us to believe, but, you know, you have to believe he's the one who saves, not us. And, I mean, you have to come to him, and you have to look to him. There's nothing else you can do. Because Jesus paid it all with his blood. You know, it's, and of course, it's just an amazing gift considering the size of this universe, you know, and how many people there are, and the fact that he was just willing to love every single one of us and, you know, and pay for our sins. It was just incredible. So, you know, that's what I would just encourage to everybody out there, you know, and just plead with everybody, you know, you know, stop trying. You know, just simply come to Jesus. You know, and, you know, let him give you rest, you know, and let him save you and believe on him. Okay, uh, well, well said. And, and that's, that's what uh, we call the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. So you've just heard the good news about the free gift. Yeah, if you understand what has just been said, then right now you should be jumping for joy if you really understand it. Because what we're telling you is that I've got really good news for you. Jesus is offering eternal life in heaven to you as a free gift. Do you want it? <laughs> it's so simple a little child could understand that. And that's what Jesus wants from us. He, he wants childlike faith. Uh, but if you want to be like a philosopher or you want to try to uh, you know, complicate things, and, uh, uh, then uh, this simple gospel, this good news about the free gift, it, it just might be too, too simple for you. That's unfortunate, but some people think it sounds too simple and too easy. But that's what you need to accept, that it really is simple and easy. So there will be two groups of people. I mentioned earlier that there are some people think that eventually everybody gets to go to heaven. But uh, 
we've got too many verses that show a contrast. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it tells you that there's two options. You can perish or you can have everlasting life. Some people will perish. Some people will receive this gift of everlasting life by faith in Jesus. Uh, another verse says that uh, uh, whoever uh, believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Jesus is condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we have a group of people that are condemned, another group of people that are not condemned. They'll go to heaven instead. Uh, you've got Romans 6.23. says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So you've got death, and you know we, there's actually two deaths. The, the mortal death, where when we all die, and then the, the, the second death, where people who never put their faith in Jesus, they die the second death in the lake of, lake of fire. So you can have death or you can have eternal life as a free gift from Jesus. Uh, I have a video that explains these, this contrast better. The, t the title is um, A Matter of Life and Death, Life or Death. So I hope you watch that video too. But well done, brothers. Um, I'm sure everybody understands now that uh, salvation is simple. Salvation is easy. Jesus did the hard part. He suffered and died for us, and uh, he, he bought it with his blood, and then he says, here it is. I paid for it. I'll give it to you if you want it. You want to go to heaven? It's that easy. I hope you put your faith in Jesus tonight, and if you do, please make a comment on this video. And thank you for watching, uh, brothers. Thank you for participating with me tonight, and uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.